Good evening and welcome to the Carnegie Town Hall. This meeting of the City Council will begin in a few moments. The City Council meets on the first, second, and third Tuesday of each month at 7 p.m. and serves as the City's policymaking and legislative body. Each meeting is governed by Robert's Rule of Order unless those guidelines conflict with City Ordinance or Charter. City Council meetings offer an opportunity for citizens to speak directly to their elected representatives. Those in attendance are invited to address the Council during the public input segment at the beginning of the agenda. At that time, any issue that is not subject to formal action later in the agenda can be addressed. Testimony that concerns a resolution or an ordinance's second reading is only allowed when those specific agenda items are being addressed by the Council. When addressing the Council, citizens should speak directly into the microphones at the podium and state their names for the record after being recognized by the Chair. To accommodate and respect all viewpoints, citizen comments are limited by ordinance to no more than five minutes each. Comments should be respectful and focused on providing new information that will benefit the Council's deliberative process. By City Ordinance, all remarks must be addressed to the City Council as a body and not to any City Council member, including the Mayor. The Chair reserves the right to limit the number of speakers. City Council meetings are broadcast live on CityLink and online at SiouxFalls.org. Information regarding the City Council, its committees, meetings, briefings, and members is available by visiting SiouxFalls.org slash council or by calling the Council office at 605-367-8085. Thank you for your interest in Sioux Falls City Government. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's City Council meeting. We're certainly pleased uh, to have so many people in attendance tonight, and certainly anybody uh, that's watching at home, we certainly appreciate that as well. Today is Tuesday, August 8th. Uh, we'd like to introduce you first to your City Council. Council members Rolfing? Yes, here, here. Selberg? Yeah. Here. <laughs> Starr? Here. Staley? Here. Erickson? Here. Erpenbach? Here. Kylie? Here. Neitzer? Present. Councilor, thanks so much for being here uh, and doing what you do. We certainly appreciate it. In, in the City of Sioux Falls, folks, we do start our City Council meetings with an invocation. Tonight, uh, City Councilor Rex Rolfing will, will lead us in that invocation. Thank you, Councilor. What we'd ask is that you stand for Councilor Rolfing's invocation, and then please remain standing for our Pledge of Allegiance. Councilor Rolfing. I've been asked to keep it short and to the point, which I will do, and I hope everyone tonight will do the same. <laughs> Dear Lord, this is a thank you. This is a thank you for today as a wonderful, wonderful South Dakota summer day. We thank you for the city of Sioux Falls. We thank you for all the people that are here today and tonight to give us their thoughts, their views, and their input. We do listen, Lord. Thank you for the mayor and for my fellow city councilors that we may do what is good and right for the people of Sioux Falls. We do this all in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's council meeting. Certainly appreciate it. I do have a proclamation I'd love to read. I don't, is Harriet Yoakum in the audience tonight? Very good. Harriet's on her way, I know, but she had some car issues. But I still want to read the proclamation on her behalf. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind, whereas 100 years ago in May of 1917, under the leadership of Mar M Mr. Harvey Mitchell, 
a group of Sioux Falls citizens formed a community Sunday school service for local African Americans. Following Sunday service, a prayer and fellowship hour was inaugurated under the leadership of Reverend A.K. Gibbs, a retired Baptist minister. He also secured the first meeting place. Whereas Reverend Gibbs contacted Reverend M.W. Withers, who was serving a church in Fergus Falls, Minnesota at the time, and persuaded him to come to Sioux Falls. In the summer of 1918, that first group of Sunday school members became the charter members of St. John's Baptist Church. Welcome. Meetings continued in a municipal courtroom until 1926 when they purchased a Jewish synagogue. Whereas during this time, the St. John's Baptist Church choir traveled extensively throughout the tri-state area raising money. They were able to pay off the mortgage in 1936. Whereas the merger of St. John's Baptist Church and the Pilgrim Baptist Church in 1985 begot Friendship Baptist Church, now known as Friendship Community Church. Whereas Friendship Community Church believes in the power of prayer and includes the city of Sioux Falls, its leaders, and its citizens in their thoughts, words, and deeds. Thank you. Now, therefore, I am Mike Huther. I'm the proud mayor of the town called Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and I do by hereby proclaim August 12, 2017 as Friendship Community Church Founders Day in Sioux Falls and call upon all citizens to join me in observance of this day. How about a round of applause? And just in time, would you please just introduce yourself, uh, I know you, but introduce yourself to the people of our town. Tell us a little bit about uh, what's going on. Yes. Good evening. I'm Harriet Yoakum. I am a member of Friendship Baptist Church for over 25 years. Mayor, first of all, I would like to thank you for acknowledging and proclaiming 100 years of rich history in the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, 100 years of highly rich organizations that came here. We've had many pastors that come through here with their families and also many dignitaries. So we will be commemorating this anniversary Saturday, August 12th at the Ramada Inn from 6 to 10 o'clock at night and dance and music with a special presentation. Mayor Huther, I hope that you'll be able to attend to officially read the proclamation to our citizens of Sioux Falls. And I would also like to invite all of the esteemed members of the council as well, and members of our citizens of Sioux Falls also to come out. Because 100 years, that is rich history in Sioux Falls, and to still be standing here today as a small church that came together, that merged. And we used to be on 14th in Minnesota. Now we're at 821 South Clotus on, off of 14th in Cleveland. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And again, thank you for acknowledging our 100-year celebration of Sioux Falls. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to now turn it to our council chair, uh, Rick Kiley. Councilor? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As many of you know, this past Wednesday, we lost uh, a servant of Sioux Falls and Mr. Bob Jamison. He was a city commissioner as well as a city councilor. So I'd like to read a brief statement and then we'll open it up to any comments that the councilors uh, would like to make at that time. Bob Jamison began his public service career in 1989 when he was elected to the City Public Utilities Commission, serving in this capacity until 1994 when he was elected to the City Council under the new charter form of government. He represented the city as an at-large member until being term limited in 2002. Two years later, 
He was elected to a four-year term representing Sioux Falls Southwest District until 2006. This all adds up to roughly 17 years of service to the citizens of Sioux Falls. Bob was a proud veteran having begun his military service at the age of 17 when he enlisted in the South Dakota Air Guard as an aircraft mechanic. He was activated for service in the Korean War and upon his return was selected for pilot training. He served in the South Dakota Air Guard as a fighter pilot, squadron commander, director of operations, and chief of staff. He retired after 37 years at the rank of colonel. Bob was especially proud of his leadership and involvement in the Washington Pavilion, the Convention Center, and the interchanges at I-29 and 26th Street and I-229 and Louise Avenue. He played an instrumental role in the establishment of Veterans Memorial Park and helped to facilitate the jointly funded city, county, Siouxland libraries. On behalf of the Sioux Falls City Council, I want to express our deepest condolences to Bob's wife, Shirley, former city councilor, Greg Jamison, and the rest of the Jamison family. Bob was a good man who served his city with honor and distinction. At this point, I'd like to open it up to other city councilors that may wish to offer their own condolences or remembrance. Councilor Staley. Um, I got to know Bob Jamison about 11 years ago. We were dealing with the Drake Springs pool, and he was the chair of the council at that time. And um, these <clears throat> comments I'm going to share with you, I'd asked Greg if I could share them, and he said that would be fine. So um, through, through the years, Bob and I had our disagreements, but uh, about four years ago, Bob was dying. Um, he had been hospitalized uh, at the VA and at McKinnon for several months, um, and I had asked Greg if I could take him some flowers. And I did. I took him up to Bob. He was surprised to see me come into his room. His wife Shirley was there. And I took his hand and I said, Bob, we've had our disagreements, but I so appreciate what you've done for our city. And we started talking and he started sharing with me his feelings about city government. Uh, it was wonderful. Then last year, last fall, I see Bob at a funeral. He's standing tall, he's walking, he's driving. I said, Bob, you're a miracle. And he was a miracle. He had a fabulous uh, run with his sons during this time. But I called him after I got elected. Again, we had an in-depth conversation about the different forms of government because he, has, he had this unique experience of being in the commission forum and being in this new council forum. And, uh, so we, we talked about ways this could be tweaked and maybe things that we could do moving forward to make this even better. So I'm, I was deeply grateful um, to know Bob in this last part of his life and uh, our prayers are with the family. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Neitzer. I want to thank Bob for his service to our country and our city. His spirit of service and sacrifice is a model for all of us to aspire to. We owe him and his family our sincere gratitude, and I'd like to extend my prayers and deepest condolences to his family. May he rest in peace. Thank you. Councillor Selberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wanted to say a quick word, because I am occupying the same seat that uh, Mr. Jamison uh, occupied, as well as his son. I didn't know him really well, but I will finally remember an event last year where uh, we were had a nice visit, um, had a nice picture of the last three people to occupy this seat. It was just before I had taken office, and I, it was really an honor to follow in his footsteps, and I'll remember that visit very fondly. But as Councillor um, Kylie had mentioned, it's quite a resume and quite a life well lived. A fighter pilot, an entrepreneur, a commissioner, a city councillor, and somewhere in there, he found the time to uh, take on his most important role as father to nine children. So we want to send along his, our condolences to his family and thanks to them for sharing him with our city. Sioux Falls is definitely the better for it. Any other comments? Well, thank you. The visitation um, was held today with a scripture service beginning just a short time ago uh, this evening. Massive Christian burial will be held tomorrow, Wednesday, August 9th, 10.30 a.m. at Christ the King Catholic Church at 26th and Lake Avenue. Interment will be at the Black Hills National Cemetery in Sturgis, South Dakota. 
on a later date. So if we could all have a moment of silence in Bob's memory. Thank you very much. Again, we offer our condolences to the Jamison family. We will keep Bob and family in our thoughts and prayers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council Chair, thank you as well. Council, we're now going to move on to our consent agenda. Uh, any motions, changes, discussion? Councilor uh, Staley? Um, I was going to pull um, the item concerning the building facade program. Very good. Thank you. <clears throat> Council, any other comments, motions? Move to approve, Urban Buck. Second, Kylie. There's been a motion to approve the other items on the consent agenda. Uh, if there is no discussion, a roll call vote, please. Council members Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Council, thank you. That is passed 8 to 0. Our regular agenda tonight, any motions, changes to that? Move to approve, Erickson. Second, Staley. Thank you. There's been a motion to approve our agenda tonight. It has been seconded. A roll call vote, please. Council members Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Th that has also passed 8 to 0. Thank you, Council. Uh, folks, welcome to tonight's City Council meeting. Certainly appreciate your attendance tonight. We also know that there's a, a couple of uh, topics that are coming up later on that many of you are here to, to speak to, and, and we appreciate that. However, there's also another opportunity for you to engage the Council, and that is right now. Uh, if there's an item that you'd like to discuss uh, that's not on the agenda later on, please just come forward, uh, state your name, uh, as well as keep your comments, please, to five minutes or less. Uh, and then all we'd ask is just try to stay as a professional uh, as, as you possibly can be. So again, anybody interested? Welcome. Sierra Bruce Sorrentis, Two Falls. Um, we had some issues at Redwood Estates. Um, I went to the property on Friday. It was a project, the worst apartment complex that you can imagine from the interior to the exterior. Contacted code enforcement, city attorney's office. I'm not going to get into details with it. Legacy management has gave me permission to talk on their behalf because the owner and the manager cannot be here. The manager is Julie Myers. Um, she has been on the property for about four to five months. She is changing everything around from eviction to screening tenants to doing exterior and interior um, violations that need to be done here. Um, there was some concerns with the citizens at Oakview neighborhood about the police calls for service. Um, there is a lot of drugs that have happened over there. Um, the undercovers are working with um, management to get those drugs under control. We do have tenants in there that is cooperating with law enforcement just to let the public know. I think bringing this open to the public because Oakview or nobody else knew what was going on behind the scenes, but this particular property, they need to know just a certain extent of what's going on here. Um, as I spoke to Julie Myers, she's very wonderful with Legacy. She is doing everything she can to straighten up this property, and we look forward for her to continue to do that. I then talked to the owner, and the owner is keeping leg Legacy management in. The reason why it got this bad it was because of poor management. That's why it got this bad. I'm going to um, not say... Um, more than what I need to say here, but they are working with the city and code enforcement and everybody else to fix their issues here. Hopefully that we can proceed and that the neighbors of Oakview can be happy with the results coming and not just straightening out the garages. There's more than just the garages that need to be done here. Now, um, you know, you come to public input and, and the mayor says, that we have to be professional and that we have to keep our minutes to five minutes or less. But the city official made a comment to this other city official 
on Tuesday of last Tuesday about um, your learning. And I think that the comment that, that the city official made to uh, Pat Storm um, was not very professional and that the person that made that comment um, should apologize because we're here to be professional as much as well as the government, city government is to be professional with other city governments here on that issue. Um, next week, I will be getting on to um, Holiday Manor Apartments, as well as the Oakview Library. Um, James, the branch manager, I have spoken to him. He has done an awesome job. There is more in place for Oakview here. Oakview neighbors should not have to deal with slumlords. So again, I gave them the number to Julie Myers for them to work with that rental so we can all live in peace back there in Oak View neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, anybody else want to engage the council? Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move to item number, oh no, let's move to uh, the consent agenda uh, item uh, that Councilor Sealy wanted to talk about. It's the facade easement program. Uh, Darren Ketchum, are you, are you here please? Thank you, Adam Roach was. Adam Roach. Thank you, Adam. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, Adam Roach, Community Development Department. Councilor Staley? Yes, Adam, I, ha I had a question, and this is kind of going to be a little educational trip for our, our guests here tonight sure. as well. Uh, facade easement program has been awarded to uh, the Norm Drake's Corporation, correct? Correct. Okay, so the first question is, um, how much is the facade easement for these people here who might not know and tell them a little bit about what that entails Sure, uh, the facade easement funding is utilized to a uh, bring a building back uh, If you will uh, a building that may has had a slip cover on it um, It may be uh, in disrepair things of that nature, but uh, the glory of the program is to bring those buildings back to a historic nature And how much was this one for this one was for $80,000 80, so then, in essence, the city is going to own the front part of his, that veneer of his property. That's correct. The city okay. has a, a real estate easement on these properties. How, so the next question is, how, are, how did you determine who gets this, this facade easement money? So every year we do a, a round of applications um, that we receive. We don't uh, have an official announcement date on these applications. We just take them as they come. And as those, uh, the merits of the program, as those applications come in and they are run through a review process through the downtown design uh, committee, and they're also run through the Board of Historic Preservation, and then ultimately the mayor, and then we bring those forward to the city council for a governing body to approve. Which is what we're doing tonight. That's correct. The, it, uh, okay, and then the next question I wanted to ask is that he, apparently that company had gotten a facade easement on the Copper Lounge as well? Uh, no, that was under uh, Tim Cant in 2007. Okay, okay, excuse me. So, so let's talk about where we're at with that because sure. that, that's a unique thing because we're giving them the veneer money and then when a building is destroyed, what insurance does the city have of getting that uh, Sure, uh, I have a prepared statement that I, I'd like to, to read here. Uh, the city had a facade easement on the property that was Copper Lounge. Uh, terms of the original facade easement agreement allow the property owners to reconstruct the facade so long as reconstruction serves the purpose and intent of the facade program. The proposed design will be similar in scale and include many of the same architectural elements of the former building. The Board of Historic Preservation has reviewed the reconstruction plans in accordance to the Secretary of Interior standards for redevelopment and recommended approval. Um, permit to build, if not already, will be issued soon. Um, at this point, the property owners have not material breached, materially breached the easement agreement, so no other action on behalf of the city to protect our interest is required at this time. The Community Development Department will continue to monitor uh, compliance with construction and the original facade easement agreement to ensure compliance, compliance of this agreement is met. So under what circumstances would we get paid back a money for a facade easement? Um, if they decided not to reconstruct uh, the building or if they did not want to um, add in those um, those elements that we requested similar to the um, but I mean, I'm just saying in, in moving forward it, there's no clause within that agreement that says if there's a destruction of the property they would ever pay us back then uh, there are many clauses in that in the, the agreement it's a 27 page agreement it covers everything from um, acts of God to um, you know the, the building just falling over okay thank you yep Councilor Muck. 
point of clarification then was this conversation about the $80,000 item that was pulled from the consent agenda was it was that and more which is the copper the former copper lounge is that at 130 South Phillips Avenue no that is uh, pave that's the former Skelly's building at 130 and that's the South one that Phillips. we have what we're actually gonna vote on that's correct yep okay I would move approval on that item please Second, Erickson. There's been a motion to approve this item. It has been seconded. Uh, a roll call vote, please. Council members Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0. Thank you. Item number 8. Second reading, an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the code of ordinances of the city by amending chapter 95 Parks and Recreation, requiring park board composition based on city council districts. Thank you. Jim. Uh, uh, Councilor Staley. Um, this is the ordinance, a park board redistricting ordinance that you've probably heard about these past weeks. First of all, let me say that um, I spent hours collaborating with my colleagues. We met, we talked about all different various um, elements of this ordinance as to how many members should be involved with it. We talked about the, limit, the number of years in a term. We talked about perhaps having elections. And I listened to everything that was uh, discussed in the dialogue and worked it as much as I could into the body of this ordinance. Uh, so we've come up with an ordinance that has uh, seven members. Five of them would come from council districts, the Northwest, Northeast, Central, Southeast, Southwest, representation like we have on the City Council. Also there's two at-large positions provided for. This, and this ordinance is about being proactive in policy to provide representation to our citizens as we grow in our population and as we grow in diversity. This ordinance, if passed, or should I say when passed, will give guidelines to ensure that there is diversity at the table in the discussion. No board member will lose their position. And as long as the next mayor would reappoint them, they can serve their 10-year total term. We did this in great respect to the current board members. And let me say we also did this, my council members were very concerned as we were discussing this, that this not be um, a some kind of a, a comment about criticism towards the current park board members. Absolutely not. This is about moving forward in our community. Historically, the park board, and this is factual, has been living on the south end of town. And that doesn't mean that south enders don't care about people on the north side, but there's something about living in that area, tasting it, breathing it, seeing it every day, that gives you a little more awareness of what's going on you bring that discussion to the table. And I'm gonna equate this to what we've been seeing on the annexation task force. We have people, four, four members from different parts of our unannexed, annexed area coming together, representing their area, but they're talking about a policy that's gonna represent everybody. And, and I love the dialogue there. It is, it's real democracy. So this is about being responsive, being uh, representative of the people and again it's not to a slap at all to the current park board nor is it a slap to our, our parks director Don Kearney or our mayor and the mayor and the current park board members won't be affected by this at all so it's just about moving forward to give all people in our community a voice folks uh, this is an opportunity for you to engage the council on this topic as well it's a second reading so what we'd ask is that if you are interested in talking on this topic just come forward introduce yourself and if you could keep your comments to five minutes or less we'd appreciate it and then one one other caveat if you don't mind um, if you find uh, the same topic being covered again and again we'd ask you to, uh, to, to move on to a different topic uh, within uh, uh, this particular uh, uh, second reading. So uh, again, but welcome, Sierra. We do have issues on diversity. Sierra, uh, could you just introduce yourself? Sierra Bruce, Sora, Sioux Falls. And I'm gonna point it out here, and it's not trying to be racial at all, but we have park board members that had told the news media that we have 
people from different races, I know I'm like colorblind. We have one race on that board and we have rich people. We should have LGBT people on that board, different colors and different backgrounds of financial, rich, middle class, and poor people on that board. Speaking of that, 74 full-time employees with the Parks Department is all one race. The Parks Board, all of those Parks Board members are one race. We have an issue. We need to accept that we have an issue. We need diversity in here. We don't need one rich side to take over the whole city. And I'm not saying nothing about the rich people at all. Don't get me wrong with that. But the rich people cannot relate to some of the districts in our area. If this is not alarming to people, what I'm saying here, that we need diversity, we are in um, the, the city government and these employees with all one race is very alarming. And it's just not on the parks board. We have it in the fire department also, and we can go on and on and on with it. We need diversity here. So I agree with Teresa. I think that it comes to a vote and it is vetoed. I will be way on the bandwagon to do a petition drive. Diversity is a beautiful thing and we need everybody from different colors and backgrounds and lifestyles to be on this parks board. Thank you. Thank you, Sierra. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Liz Meilenberg. I'm a 43-year Sioux Falls resident. And I would like to comment on the Park Board's position as stated by a former Park Board member and published on Sunday, July 8, 2017 in the Argus Leader. The following statement was offered in response to the proposed legislation presently before the Council. Quote, such a system would limit the pool of qualified candidates. There's no guarantee that someone from a designated area possesses the time, interest, and ability to serve as an effective board member, unquote. As a former school teacher for 28 years, I want to offer my response in the on the following comments. Number one, this is a very anti-democratic position, not representative of all citizens, and frankly, I find it offensive and elitist. What if that reasoning were applied in the classroom in the following manner by restricting students running for class officers to only those who came from certain neighborhoods within the school boundaries because the others were deemed not qualified? Would you support that? Number two, Sioux Falls is a large enough community to find interest, interested, qualified, and informed citizens in each district to serve on the park board. If the Park Board's exclusionary statement of qualified citizens were true, the City Council would also be unable to find qualified candidates in each district. That has never been a problem. Again, the Park Board's position and statement is erroneous, empty of validity, and conveys an attitude of superiority and elitism. Number three. The enormous amounts of funds controlled and spent by this department need more public input and feedback from a variety of citizens from varying economic backgrounds and geographical re residences. This is one of the highest funded departments in our city, and those funds are generated from all taxpaying citizens. Thus, geographical representation needs to be embraced. In conclusion, Common sense demands application. Fairness and democratic principles in the form of equal and geographical representation need to be modeled in our Sioux Falls city government. Geographical representation needs to be embraced as our students are watching the adults. And lastly, to reject geographical representation is to reject the equal representation principles of democracy on which our nation was founded. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, anybody else want to engage the council? Welcome.
Good evening. I'm John Mathias from Sioux Falls, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, make some comments on this issue. You're considering this in, in, in an important era for Sioux Falls and South Dakota. We live and work in a predominantly rural state, but in a growing city that is still small enough that a, a large percentage of the metro population is native to the area, B, we know our neighbors, business leaders, and public officials, and C, we supposedly have a high degree of familiarity, trust, cordiality, conservative values, and strong work ethic. That's how we feel about ourselves. We're swell. But how do we rate in an objective assessment of many of those values? In 2015, the Pulitzer Prize winning Center for Public Integrity in Washington, D.C. conducted a state-by-state -state integrity investigation to establish transparency and accountability for all 50 states. South Dakota, unfortunately, suffered failing grades in nine of the investigation's 13 categories, making it 47th in the nation overall. The study concludes, quote, the state lacks robust laws to prevent corruption, apparently the result of a sense, at least among South Dakota's ruling class, that burdensome controls are not needed in a rural state with a supposedly high degree of familiarity, trust, and cordiality. Now this was a measure of state government, but state government is comprised of South Dakotans and as the largest city in South Dakota, the values and ethics present in Sioux Falls can hardly be regarded as separate and distinct from the rest of the state. I'm sure we're all mortified to hear this assessment of our state. And would we all not wish to take steps to change that? While we may regard our status quo as just fine, here's direct evidence that our status quo needs a reassessment. There is a saying that if nothing ever changes, nothing ever changes. So let's do our part in who falls government to set an example for all South Dakotans to change this image of poor governmental transparency and accountability. Appearances matter where public confidence in government is concerned. I challenge you, our elected officials, to embrace an edict of going to great lengths to avoid the appearance of impropriety, to consider in your deliberations and decisions, how will this appear to all the citizens we represent? The goals of transparency in government and equal representation are inherently worthwhile and honorable goals. This proposal is one step toward increasing those goals and the image of Sioux Falls government as an open book accessible to all. It is forward looking for our growing metropolitan area and makes good common sense. I'm aware of objections about all variety of negative consequences of passing this ordinance. Many are projections only with, without substantiation or precedent and even border on hysteria about a simple revision to the existing method of approach of appointing park board members. It's not the creation of an entirely new task force or additional layer of government. These dire predictions are included in the press release posted on the city website today, attributed to the mayor and the unspecified city administration team. My takeaway is a borrowed phrase, methinks thou dost protest too much, and I urge you to pass this ordinance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Did anybody else want to engage the council? Welcome. Folks, could I ask if you want to do this, just come up forward uh, and just get ready for the next uh, speaker as well. Uh, I'd appreciate that. Welcome. Hi, I'm <coughs> Valerie Ray, uh, Sioux Falls. I think definitely it would be a good plan to have volunteer input from every part of town. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, let me start over. <laughs> you're, you're good, Valerie. Keep okay, going. Thank you. Um, on the east side, Meldrum Park is near Rolling Hills, a 48 apartment complex with four to six kids in each family. In mid-May, all the old swings and toys 
were removed. By mid-July, they began replacing the equipment. However, the playground is not ready for use by today, August 8th. Perhaps the kids won't get to play on the equipment before returning to school. An Eastside Volunteer Park Board member would have been a great solution for this unfortunate incident. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Valerie. Thank we you. appreciate it. Thank you. Folks, anybody else? Welcome. Hi, my name is Zach DeBoer. Uh, I'm the vice chair of the city's Visual Arts Commission, and I live in the Central District. It is my belief that as our city continues to grow, the need for individual district representation on our Parks and Recreation Board is necessary. Sioux Falls is home to over 80 public parks, 29 miles of bike trails, eight public pools, and three city-owned golf courses. Last month, I attended the Parks and Recreation Board meeting where this district ordinance was uh, presented. During public input, I asked the board if any of them had been to all 80 parks, biked all 29 miles, swam in all eight pools, or golfed on all three courses. Uh, of course, the answer was no. Uh, it's unrealistic to expect each member of the parks board uh, to have a full knowledge of each one of these facilities. The people who understand our neighborhood parks best are the people that live near them. They walk through them every day, they bring their kids there, take their dogs for walks, they play basketball, horseshoes, tag, hide and seek in those parks. They know them better than anyone else ever could. I've heard the phrase, if it's not broke, don't fix it, a lot while we talk about this. Uh, I've always hated that saying. It's one step away from that's the way we've always done it. I believe we should always be looking for ways to improve our city, and I believe this ordinance offers us the chance to do that. Imagine this, it's 2019, a new member is selected to join the Parks Board to represent the Northeast District. During their first meeting, they'd be handed a packet of orientation materials, including a list of parks and parks facilities that lie within their districts. They would then be tasked with physically visiting these places uh, to gain a greater understanding of those individual parks' needs. Because they live within that district, their knowledge of not only the parks, uh, but the schools, the roads, the neighborhoods that surround them uh, would only bring greater insight to the discussion uh, and decision-making process. Now, city Hall claims that filling city board vacancies is challenging, uh, and, and that by adding this criteria to the selection process would only make it more difficult. Uh, now, that might be true of some or most of the city boards, uh, but this is the Parks and Recreation Board we're talking about. This is the, it's not the Plumbing Board of Appeals and Examiners or the Solid Waste Planning Board. No offense if any of them are in the room. The Parks Board is popular and it's competitive. It's a, it's a board people want to be a part of. Uh, when was the last time there was an extended vacancy on the Parks Board? There isn't a shortage of applicants now and there certainly won't be by the time the last term of the current board members ends in 2027 when the population of Sioux Falls is expected to grow by 50,000 people. Now it's true this would be the only board that would have district specific requirements but most of the 42 other boards do have member-specific requirements. For example, uh, the Visual Arts Commission, the commission I serve on, requires one practicing artist and one member of the Sioux Falls Arts Council's Board of Directors, directors to make up their seven-member group. Uh, the Business Improvement District Board, the Bid Board, uh, they require that three of its members be owners of property within the Bid District, one of which must be assessed the maximum amount, a, at least one member should be a district resident, one member must operate a business within that district, and at least one member should represent DTSF's board of directors. Those are very specific qualifications that need to be met, and the potential pool of applicants is much smaller than those uh, that would be found in each district. Uh, for example, there are eight, around 1,800 people uh, that live within the business improvement district, whereas the northeastern district is home to about 34,000 citizens. Uh, the Parks and Recreation Board has no special qualifications for their membership. The suggestion that creating park districts could create turf wars, to me, is a, a little disrespectful and with a, maybe a little touch of fear-mongering. In front of me, there are eight city councilors, five of which represent a single district in our city. Uh, do we accuse them of making, those, making decisions based only on the benefit of their district? No, of course not. They make their decisions for the good of the entire city while still being attuned to the specific needs of their districts. The Parks Board would operate in the same manner. 
Now, I don't believe that the current or past parks board plays favorites or makes their decisions based on their geographic location in any way. I haven't seen any indication or, ev or evidence to suggest otherwise. Uh, I also know that parks are all on a cyclical and scheduled update plan and receive equal attention. The work that our Parks and Rec Department and the Parks and Rec Board does is phenomenal and is amongst the best in the country uh, as proven by their CAPRA accreditation. That's something to be incredibly proud of. It's important to understand that this ordinance isn't to rectify any misdeeds or mistakes made by this board. Rather, this ordinance would offer the Parks Board even greater perspectives and insight into the work that they do. I know most of you have already made up your decision on how you're going to vote tonight. But I would urge you to listen to the people that are here to speak in favor of this ordinance. This minor change to the makeup of the future Parks and Recreation Board would ensure that as our city continues to grow, all of our parks, neighborhoods, and citizens are represented and have a voice. Thank you. Thanks, Zach. Council, uh, Zach went over on time. Uh, I'll, I'll keep that in. I'll be more aggressive with the next speakers. <laughs> That's with you. Uh, welcome. Good to have you here. Good evening, Nancy Tapkin from the Terrace Park neighborhood. Citizen boards are a microcosm of our local and national government and should reflect the same equal representation parameters. To say that any board made up largely of citizens from one district or another provides equal representation for the entire city is just not accurate. We all bring ourselves to everything we do and we all have biases. It's not a reflection on any person or group, it's just reality. But it makes the case for a geographically diverse park board even stronger. Councilor Michelle Urbanbach's comment in the Argus that district requirements on the park board would create turf wars is nonsense. Don't believe that. The implication is that districts not currently represented on the board would bring this kind of turf war behavior to their decision making. And that members from other districts couldn't possibly make thoughtful, informed decisions. Don't believe that either. Boards are meant not only to be forward thinking, but also to be guardians of the treasures they're entrusted with, whether that's a city, the state theater, or a park system. The original master plan for Terrace Park called for the removal of every piece of quartz east of the bandstand. That seven stairways, not seven steps, seven long stairways, three to five tiers each. Called for the removal of the lion's den and assorted paths. Just a few years before Terrace Park's historic 100th anniversary, the Park Board approved that plan, which would have destroyed a huge piece of the history we were about to commemorate. People don't come to Terrace Park because it's just like all the other parks. They don't come to marvel at cement sidewalks. They come because it's different. You might hear that the terrace plan was about accessibility. Well, at a quick count, there are at least seven accessible entrances at the park. And you might hear that neighbors clapped for the plan at a neighborhood association meeting. I'll take the hit for that because I started the clapping. I clapped because three sets of stairways came off the chopping block. I clapped because the lion's den came off the chopping block. And I clapped for the historic lighting that was proposed and benches along the walkways. I never clapped because they were gonna take all the courts out. It shouldn't take a national register designation to stop the decimation of one of our city's most historic parks. All the Terrace Park issues should really never have happened last year. The park board, the guardians of our city's green spaces should have understood that that plan was not right for that park, but they missed it. The historic significance of Terrace Park got missed the neighborhood feeling around the park got missed, and the significance to the city got missed. That is reason enough for a more diversified park board. Progress sometimes calls for preservation. The path forward isn't always straight, and it isn't always made of cement. Sometimes a quartz path is just what a city needs. A more geographically diverse park board might have understood that. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, I'm Carol Flower, and I've lived in Sioux Falls a very long time. 
I would like to encourage you to vote for this proposal. You have an incredible opportunity with one fell swoop, one vote, to all of a sudden get people involved in Sioux Falls, people that normally may not want to be involved in the city government or what goes on in their city. But by having this, this district represented by different people, not only does this spill over, but it's like a ripple. It will involve people that are in these, these neighborhoods. I think this is an incredible opportunity for you to make this happen. And as one of the previous speakers said, not every park needs to be the same. We don't need cookie cutter parks. That people who live in a district, they know what they want for their parks. And they should be able to, to manage to have that happen. And so, again, I would like to encourage you strongly to vote for this wonderful opportunity that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Folks, anybody else? Welcome. Good evening. My name is Mike Crane. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I live in Sioux Falls. I was a member of the park board for 10 years from 2006 to 2016. I'm here tonight to speak briefly on the other side of this issue. In 2006, on the day that my appointment to the board appeared in the Argus Leader, an acquaintance of mine who had served on the park board in the 80s and the 90s stopped me at a local restaurant and after he had congratulated me on my appointment, he looked, in, he looked me in the eye and said, the park board will be the best volunteer job you've ever had. Don't mess it up. Since I had yet to attend a meeting, hadn't cast a vote, I had to ask him what he was talking about. <clears throat> he went on to say that one of the strengths of the board was the fact that members didn't have pet projects, that they worked as a group, and they worked to provide a park system that addressed the needs of the whole community. I tell you this story because I believe it reflects how the board has worked through the years to pro provide a balanced program that responds to the recreational needs of the, of the community. I have to admit that when I look at the park system and reflect back on the decisions that were made during my tenure, I'm not sure what problem we're hoping to resolve or to address here tonight. You have a system and a staff that is nationally recognized and accredited. It's one of fewer than 200 parks in the, in the United States to achieve that kind of des designation. And I can tell you, having been through both of the accreditation processes that have gone on since 2010, the, the process looked at virtually every aspect of the department's operation, practices, and capital spending to determine that we were doing things in the best interests of our community. You have a system that is supported by the community. Community satisfaction surveys have, have consistently ranked, ranked the parks and the park system at, in the upper 90s percents. You have a staff that works year round to evaluate programs and brings forward new ideas to met, better need, meet the recreational needs of our community. And you have a board a volunteer board that strives to maintain existing facilities and bring new programming forward for all areas of the community. I don't believe that mandatory geographic representation for park board members will address any problem real or perceived within the park department. Instead, I would encourage each of you as community leaders to continue to support the park programs that exist today and to participate in the discussions that will go forward regarding the f future park policies and program. As our community continues to grow and resources are spread even further, important issues regarding parks are going to need your guidance and your input. For example, can our system continue to support the expansion of our neighborhood park program as we continue to grow? Can should we continue to promote the development of neighborhood recreation centers in conjunction with our school, the expansion of schools in our community? Or how should we ensure that we are adequately maintaining 
the facilities that we have throughout the entire city as we get bigger. By actively participating in these and many of the other important decisions that will have to be made about the park programs, I believe we can do more to ensure the continued success of our system than we can by passing this ordinance tonight. I would urge you to vote no. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Mike. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Don Kearney, Director of Parks and Rec. Um, looking back at some of the uh, analogies and the comparisons to Sioux Falls, uh, Minneapolis was thrown out as one of those cities where uh, the Parks and Rec board members are elected uh, by uh, council district. And uh, so I took that a little bit further and, and did a little bit more research on, okay, how many other uh, cities are set up that way? And I tried to use some of the peer cities that we look at uh, in some of our other comparisons. And uh, it's pretty clear by looking at this chart that if you have taxing authority and spending authority, uh, they definitely do elect by district. Uh, certainly, as you can see in the case of Sioux Falls, um, we do not have taxing authority as a Parks and Rec Board, nor do we have uh, spending authority as a Parks and Recreation Board. Uh, I would note that Omaha, Lincoln, Des Moines, cities much larger than Sioux Falls, uh, operate under the same scenario that we do, where they're at elected at large. Uh, I would share with you that uh, moving into districts within Sioux Falls would certainly be the exception and not the rule in the Midwest. Uh, I'd also share that I believe the system that we currently have works really well. I've had an opportunity to serve in, in many other communities besides Sioux Falls, and this is the best system that I've ever worked with. Um, I just close by saying that the mayor and the city council have had the opportunity to select the very best, most qualified board members uh, uh, in, under the current system, regardless of where they live. Uh, we've built one of the best park systems in the country. Not me, uh, you, the city, the community has done that over the years. Uh, and it's served the city of Sioux Falls very well for many years. Um, we really don't have any idea why we need to change it now. We think it's bad policy and certainly not needed uh, in our current system that's been so successful. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to engage the council? Very good, welcome. Tim Stanga. I don't have anything against the, the park members because I know that they're, they're stressed and they, and they got a lot of things to go through, but I also look at being able to give the city council or somebody else to talk to in their uh, districts. Pat could have talked to the person in the district in my neighborhood and Meldrum Park probably would have been done at a different time. Instead of when the kids are out of school, let's do it when the kids are in school. Frank, o Frank, Frank Olson swimming pool. I've got a feeling, and from what I've heard, is that it's gonna go from a swimming, swimming pool to a spray pool. I'm hoping that the Parks Department, or the, the board, Parks Board and the Parks Department sits down with his neighborhood and asks his neighborhood what they really want. Is it more value to, to your house to have a swimming pool or a spray pool? I think more people would say they'd rather have a swimming pool than a spray. I would too. Because spray, the spray parks are not really that great for, I don't know, bringing kids and that. But it is pretty sad when you have to bring the person that's ahead of the park board, the park department to come in and plead to you guys on what's good or bad for the city. Every single one of you have been hired by the citizens of Sioux Falls. The taxpayers pay probably two thirds of our budget in the park and rec department. It's a big majority of it. A lot of things that people will never go to, never walk into, but they still have to pay taxes on every single thing that is done through the park board. I just think that being able to have representation through the whole city would be the way to go. If you do, if you have to put it on a trial period, but there are people that are 
in this city. I don't care if it's a northwest side. I don't care if it's a northeast side. There are people that want this city to thrive. They want this city to move forward. But they also want to have a little say in what's going on. And I'm hoping that you guys will vote yes. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate it. Folks, I will just mention there are probably a number of comments that have been reiterated. Um, again, I would just ask you, uh, if you've got something um, unique to say or that will add to the conversation, uh, I apologize, I should, maybe shouldn't have said it in that way, um, that, that is different, uh, that will lend more context or additional context, that's where we appreciate you'd, you'd go. Um, uh, we are starting to get more repetitive in, in the comments, so welcome, sir. Good evening. George Hamilton. Hey, George. Uh, as I sit here and listen, because I was at home watching this on TV and I decided to come down here. Uh, I don't know if picking the board by districts would solve the problem or how it's addressed now that the members are picked and they all live in one part of town, it has been said. but. Coming from Texas, Austin, Texas, and seeing how neighborhoods grew when the city grew, I'm seeing the same thing that's happening in Sioux Falls because I don't know whether it's because of political shifts or racial shifts that are not meant to be racial that happen, but if I was to draw a circle around this building we're in right now and just go a half a mile out, I can't play baseball at a park when I used to could play baseball at Drake Springs when we played baseball. I can't play outdoor basketball because unless I go up to Whittier Park because they've taken things out of the core neighborhoods of this city. Now, why those issues have been addressed and baseball has moved to Harmondon Park in these big complexes and football went out of my neighborhood out to the Pentagon and the way it's shifting, somebody who's on the park board are making these choices that are taking the, the, the core neighborhood parks and moving activities that the neighborhood people want to have in that neighborhood and having to travel to go do these activities. So as we do move forward on voting on if it's chosen by district, maybe the district might have more input in the exact neighborhood that's being represented because I do not feel that the core neighborhood, which would be from uh, Cleveland Avenue back over here to maybe Kiowanas, maybe south to 41st, we don't have the same representation or the level of parks or the level of things that go into parks that are going out into the new neighborhoods that are being expanded. So maybe some direct representation right here by those people, as the previous gentleman said, in those neighborhoods who want to know why we don't have or why we lose things in our neighborhood and then are forced to drive or take our children to other neighborhoods to have. Because when we redesigned Drake Springs, <clears throat> I don't know what happened there, you know, why the softball field had to go, uh, why the skate park became on this side, you know, it's condensed, but we have Yankton Trail, that is a large park that sits vacant for the most of the time, except when we have specialty events there, you know, but you can't play basketball at Yankton Trails, you can't play softball at Yankton Trails, so, there is something that needs to be done about representation from the neighborhood associations and the neighborhoods to address the lack of input by the citizens of those neighborhoods. And thank you. Thanks, George. Appreciate it. Folks, anybody else? Uh, welcome. Hi. My name is... Oh, I'll wait till I get up here. Thank you. My name is Dee Halverson, I do. and I've lived in Sioux Falls for a long, long time. And this gentleman, I want you to check out Cherry Creek Park, which has wonderful facilities that's uh, west of Cleveland. 
And then Frank Olson has all kinds of baseball diamonds right across the street for the Frank Olson pool. So there are parks there that accommodate both of those things that he lost at Drake Springs. Um, I think Frank Olson should be another indoor aquatics facility. I've had neighbors to, uh, come over to work at the MAC and they love it. So they're hoping that they get an indoor facility like the MAC at the Frank Olson Park. And I'd just like to say that the parks in Sioux Falls are wonderful. I don't see why we're even doing this thing because we have wonderful parks in all different kinds of neighborhoods. And uh, I just think that this is an issue that shouldn't even be discussed. Why are we not, why are we even doing this? This is just kind of crazy. Find something that's broken and fix that, but leave this alone because this is working well. So don't mess with it. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dee, appreciate it. Folks, uh, how about a couple more comments if they're, if they're unique? And if not, I'm gonna turn it over to the council. Councilors, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Councilor Neisert. Yeah, um, I'm just going to add lib a little bit because I've been weighing, the, weighing this all day today, and frankly, I don't want to make you endure my unedited statement. So um, I, as I was looking at this, I was making a list of upsides and downsides, pros and cons, and I, I have to tell you, honestly, both of the lists were really, really short. Um, I, I really do see both sides of this. Uh, the Parks Board members uh, bring up some valid points, as, as did the director, also in last week's comments. Um, some argue this is a solution in search of a problem. That's a fair point. I guess I, I don't see a major problem either. I don't see uh, a, a big issue. I would only say that there are some things that they're not broken and they're not a problem, but we're always looking to improve things, so there's an argument there. I, I find the argument that um, having district designations is going to create turf wars, division, all that. I, I really find that unpersuasive, and I'm just going by my own personal um, experience in my first year on, here on the council. I represent the Northwest District, but never has it ever occurred to me to oppose a project because it's not in my district. I, you know, the Louise Avenue project last year, I, it, it didn't even cross my mind to have a problem with that because it was in the Southwest District. And T. Ellis Road, I've been a big advocate for. So it, it, it I, I just, I would just give citizens more credit than that. It just, it, up on this body, you just don't have it. And we're, we have districts. There are no turf wars. We just don't think like that. We do what's best for the city, period. I, I also don't accept the argument that it would be hard to find qualified candidates. You've got we're getting close to 40,000 people in each district. I'm pretty sure we can find one qualified applicant that is willing to serve. And remember, the qualifications is you have to be a citizen and you have to care about your community. That's it. The, the other thing that I guess I've been thinking about is the arguments for not having districts. And it, the chart was, was, was that is uh, very revealing and that's helpful about the taxing authority. I hadn't seen that yet. Um, but the, the argument about not having districts not because you won't get the most qualified candidate, apparently our, the, the authors of our charter saw some benefit in having district designation. So apparently just having the most qualified candidate isn't always the only criterion. There may have been somebody more qualified than me to serve in this district, but they didn't live there, so they couldn't run. I, it, you know, it's possible. So I guess... At the end of the day, th this isn't going to make or break the parks board either way. It's not. It's going to continue to be excellent. Um, so I, I think these predictions of negative consequences are, are really unwarranted. Um, I don't really see much of a downside. There could be an upside. So it's, it, 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 it's really a, a, a tough one, but um, uh, we'll see. Thanks. Folks, okay, uh, Councilor Selbert. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You're welcome. Um, Councillor Neitzert hit a number of my points. I mean, this is a tough issue. It's one of those that comes out and you just kind of go, oh, guy, you know, it, there's 10 good points to 10 good points on each side of this. I mean, I, I'm going to try to keep it simple, and I, I would probably repeat a lot of what he said, but it comes down to me to this. I don't feel that there would be a downfall in the quality, the diversity, or the service of any board members by 
having them come from different districts. I just don't see it. If I did, I'd be, I'd be against this. Um, again, we talked population. He'd mentioned 40,000. I think we're roughly the same population in the Southwest District, 38 to 40,000. This is going to come about in a number of years. By the time this comes around, we're going to probably have 45 to 50,000. I, I would reiterate um, the chances we're going to have a hard time finding a qualified person who cares about this city and is going to be from the area of the parks they represent. I, I, I just don't see that as being an issue. Is this a system that's broke? No. Is it a system where there's room for improvement? Um, sure. I don't care if it's our ambulance services, the roads or the parks department, there's always room for improvement. One certain in life is change. I mean, we're, the desire for improvement is constant. It'll go on for quite some time, and I think this can add to that. I don't think it will take away from that. I don't, I, I, another reason where I'm trying to keep it simple, the people that are serving now are doing a terrific job. They're not being asked to leave. They're not being thrown off the board. Nobody's saying anybody's doing a terrible job. This will take a while to move into effect. But the concept of having representation from each district seems to work in a variety of other ways of government. I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around why it would be bad here. So, um, I, again, it's tough. Uh, I guess I would just throw out that I'm kind of leaning to the direction, obviously, of, of supporting it because I think representation from where you live is a good thing. But I would also finally just, again, reiterate to Director Carney, to those on the current board, that those who have served, that uh, we thank you for your service. This is not a, we're not refuting what you've done or anything. I think you've done excellent work for your city and your government. You're appreciated, and it's a tough one, but that's where I sit. Thank you. Council Vice Chair Erickson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, you hear a lot of us talking where we've, I mean, we're really sharing kind of the process in which we're digesting this, which is a little bit different than um, maybe other times when we vote and we have very solid, definitive, this is where we are, this is where we aren't. And, you know, I'll tell you for me personally, I can start off, going, yeah, that's, that's a great idea, let's have this conversation. And then I went, oh my gosh, what are we trying to fix? And then I kind of came back and said, well, and so it's this yo-yo of, of back and forth of where we are. Um, one thing I do want to address is, um, I know there's been a lot of crit criticism towards the administration for their lobbying efforts. I came from Pierre, from the legislature. We had what was called blue badges. They were people that were in the governor's staff. They came and they represented the governor and what he felt. They met every week. They went through the bills. They talked about pros and cons. Are we going to be neutral? Are we going to fight it? Are we going to support it? What are we going to do? This is no different than that. The mayor was elected to be the leader of the executive branch. He has his staff. And I want the directors to know at any time, regardless if you agree with me or any of us or disagree, contact us. That's, that's how we make good legislation or better legislation or terrible legislation because you might not agree with us. Um, th there is great, great opportunity from having those con conversations with, you know, Director Cooper over different ideas. And, you know, I've had many conversations with Don Kearney over the years as well. Um, and so I don't want anybody in the administration to take that criticism to heart because it's just not fair. Um, it's done, like I said, in Pierre all the time. Some may think that's not a good reason why, but I think that's been an unfortunate situation that has come out of this that you should not be criticized for being passionate about the role in which you serve, and neither should any of us as well as we move on. So I just want to say those few things. Um, one of the other things, going back to the actual ordinance, um, you know, we do all want to do what's best for the city, whether we're on a board or, or the city council. And I have no doubt in my mind that the park board, uh, the planning commission, any board, that that's your desire, that you're, you're not worried about uh, certain um, turf back and forth, that uh, I feel that our park system has won great awards. That wouldn't have been done if there wasn't a desire to want the whole city to be a good park. That wouldn't be done. Otherwise, we would only see certain areas look a certain way with many forgotten. Now, some may say that is happening, and I would disagree. I think that parts of our community look different all over the place. Um, and we all want to do what's best for the city. I keep coming back to what are we trying to fix? What are we trying to fix? Does it matter? You know, there are boards that have you know, Zach made a great point. You know, we give guidelines to the, to the bid board. We give guidelines to having experts on REMSA. We have guidelines for all different kinds of boards. This is really no different. 
But then I go back to say, our park board is one of the best boards that we have in the city, no disrespect to any other board. So does it really matter? Does, do we really need to make this change right now? So kind of where I'm at, where I've been back and forth and back and forth, it's been um, you know, an issue that uh, we've spent a lot of time on and we've got a lot of other great things going on in this community. And so uh, I'm looking forward to the vote tonight and moving to the next steps of whatever that might be. Councilor Mock. Thank you, um, and I appreciate everyone who's spoken this evening. It's, it's uh, as I told someone earlier, that this, this is part of how the democratic process works, and I appreciate all of you coming, I really do. A couple of things I want to remind you, though, that this doesn't address, it doesn't address race in diversity, it doesn't address gender in diversity, it doesn't address sexual orientation in diversity. And chiefly, it doesn't address income, which seems to be, no matter how many times the folks who wrote this say that they're not putting down this park board, we continue to hear about how rich they are and how white they are. And I'm sorry, that's a put down. You don't appreciate these folks in the way that they are. This does not dictate the income of the people that are involved in the park board. So I just want you to understand that. The other piece of this for me is that it ignores the fact that there are so many other boards that we, I realize, Zach is right, there are many of them that do have very specific qualifications, but there are many that do not. And none of them really, or very few of them, are based on geography. It doesn't make sense to me. And why do they not all then need diversity of this kind? The third thing for me is that this ignores the role of the city council in running the park system. The Parks Board is simply a citizen's advisory board. They don't get to levy taxes and they don't get to spend money. They only get to suggest to the City Council, this is what we think. And this board up here has to take that final role and say, yes or no, we're the ones that this is where the buck stops. So I'm voting no on this tonight for two reasons. One, it doesn't solve any issues. It doesn't solve any of the things that, that any of you have talked about tonight in terms of diversity, it doesn't. And second, this is piecemeal government. We need to, if we're going to do this and do it correctly, if we're gonna look at the diversity of this community and look at the diversity of the way these volunteer boards work, then let's look at all of them. Let's not govern by piecemeal, by little bites. Let's do it all, let's do it right. This isn't the right way. Council Chair Kiley. Thank you, Mayor. Well, I'm a lifelong resident of the city of Sioux Falls. In fact, in 12 short days, that'll be 64 years residing here in this city. I absolutely love it. It's one of the reasons why I ran for my city council office three years ago. Um, my father worked 36 years at John Morrell and Company. My mom was a stay-at-home mom watching over four kids. Uh, three boys and my oldest sister who was born with disabilities. So to say that we grew up with modest means gives you the picture. I can't say that I ever remember wanting, but one of the reasons why I can't remember wanting for things was because of the beautiful park system that I had and that I could take advantage of uh, as, as a child and my children could take advantage of uh, while they were children as well, too. It's, it is something that has provided me with so many opportunities. And again, I'm committed to make sure that we continue to offer those opportunities to all people uh, of all backgrounds. Um, as a biology teacher with a 36-year career in, in teaching science, uh, I often, well, I always, every year, taught about the scientific research method. And uh, the first step in that method was to define the problem. And I encouraged uh, my students to adapt the scientific method to solving their everyday problems that they encounter. It doesn't always have to be involved with big research projects. So I try to live by those same, same words, and so that, brings me to the question that I asked Councillor Staley when she first presented to me this proposal. What is the defined problem this proposal is attempting to address, other than the fact that we're not districting now? 
In other words, how is our present system of selecting board members adversely impacted our excellent park system? Our goal, after all, is to have a park within one half mile of every resident, regardless of where they live. The most recent citizen survey shows widespread support for our existing park system. Nearly 90% of respondents express satisfaction with our parks. Furthermore, our parks and rec system is accredited by the Commission for Accreditation uh, of Park and Recreation Agencies. Less than 1% of the parks in the United States have earned this prestigious distinction, less than 1%. Another concern I have is if we have several qualified candidates from a single district, but only one less qualified candidate from a, another district, how do we benefit from selecting the less qualified individual, individual? And why place limitations on the process of selecting the best qualified? I'm also concerned about applying city council standards to citizen boards. As it has been mentioned, this is a voluntary citizen advisory board. They do not have taxing or spending authority. They can only make recommendations to us, the city council. And if we don't like what they bring to us, then we have the right and we have the duty to propose and to make changes. And we have done just that. The pool fees uh, are a prime example of changes that we have recently enacted. Again, we have to remember that these are volunteer advisory boards and it is not a simple task to fill them. It's, I, and I agree with Councillor Erpenbach too, her concern that it may create infighting or turf wars that don't exist today. Do I have absolute proof of this? Maybe not quantifiable proof. However, when we were talking about the Minneapolis situation, I did do some research. And I had read uh, some comments that one of their retiring park board members had made. And he had stated that one of, he felt that his greatest accomplishments were two parks that he brought to his district. Not to the park system as a whole, but to, who, to his district. So I, I do share that concern as a possibility. And I also agree with parks board member uh, uh, Ann Octagol that diversity is measured in ways other than just the location of one's residence. So why limit ourselves to just geography? I mean, we've already heard about the different ways that, that, we, are all, uh, that we are all diverse. One that I haven't heard, quite frankly, is individuals with disabilities. So again, why limit ourselves to just geography? And Councillor Staley, you yourself have praised our park system, as many of us have done here tonight. I know I certainly have referred to it often as the crown jewel of our city. Uh, in fact, Councillor, at uh, five minutes and 45 seconds of the recent park board meeting, you stated, the intent is nothing against you. It is not meant to be a commentary on what you have done in the past or what you are doing now. You made comments similar to this tonight and as well as last week. And then at 628, of the board park, recent park board meeting, uh, you stated, we do have a wonderful park system and you have done a wonderful job of helping to beautify that. Those are your statements. So again, what is the defined problem? Um, Councillor, you, yourself, and many of us have indicated in the past and tonight that there isn't a problem. And in fact, the my case has been basically stated for me. This is, I do agree, this is a solution looking for a problem. I encourage my colleagues to vote against this proposal. Councilor Rolfing. I'm gonna weigh in here real short because I agree with what Councilor Zerpenbach and, and Kylie have said. This is, this is a solution looking for a problem that does not exist at this point. If it was a problem, we would have been looking at it a long time ago. So I'm gonna urge everybody to, uh, everyone to vote no on this also, but I do wanna say thank you to Councillor Staley for working through this the, the correct way, working through the, the, the system, if you will, through the process 
that we have on council that's unofficial, but it is a process that says, you know, go, go talk to people, uh, give them your views, and, and, and look, for, um, look for other opinions. So I really want to thank you for doing that, Councillor. Councilor Starr, did you have any comments before I go to Councilor Staley? No, I might as well jump in and okay. everybody Councilor else Starr. get a, a chance at it. Um, I, I, I feel very similar. I, I, one of the things that stood out to me was uh, <laughs> Councilor Kylie mentioning the uh, recording of the Parks Board meeting and having a chance to go back and review that part of the process and whether it was video or audio, getting a chance to know because certain boards and commissions meet at the same time we do. One of the other things that really stood out to me tonight is the talk, and it, it maybe it came home to me because of the time we've spent today as a council. We spent 45 minutes with Director Cotter going through millions of dollars worth of projects today, and we rely on our citizen boards to provide information to us, and it's been said over and over again. But at the same time, they do get a chance to dive in deeper than we get to at the council level. We spend a lot of time and we require or we rely on the work that they do. And the bottom line for me is we can always make things better. I wish the discussion would have stopped after Zach's comments earlier tonight. I think we might have had a better chance of getting this passed when all said and done. But I'm going to support this because I want to see us uh, continue to improve and make Sioux Falls a better place. Councilor Seeley. Well, um I will say in response to Councillor Kiley that um, I have worked to make this a positive discussion. I didn't want to bring up negatives. I didn't want to be critical of past park boards. Um, however, I, I do want to make a few, I was talking with a council member yesterday and they, they said, Teresa, we're talking about what needs to be fixed. What's, nothing's broke. And, and I think it's really fitting that we've got a lot of people here from the east side for a different issue, and this is the side, this is the area that has not had a representative on the park board for as long as I can remember. But I want to bring up two things that have, uh, two parks in your area. And first of all, I've got a picture of the McKenna Wading Pool up here. And this is, is a crown jewel of the city, McKenna Wading Pool. I've taken my nephews and nieces there, they love it. Uh, then, go ahead Jim, the next slide. And there it is again. I went over there today and took this picture, and, and I'm, no one was there yet, but it's, it's, it's a swimming. They have lifeguards on staff, and this thing is free. We used to have more free ones. Drake Springs used to have a free wading pool. Um, free was, it was a nice thing. Go to the and, and also we have at this, we have flowers. You see, I put a smiley face up there. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful park. Let's, it's, it's a wonderful example of what we want to go for. So go ahead and the next one. Now, next we have, this is Masseur Pioneer Park. And back uh, years ago, uh, when I was working with Drake Springs, which by the way, I'm not bringing that up because it's very contentious, but that's another issue of where the park board and the citizens didn't agree. And by 76% of the vote, we, we had that happen in, in 2007. But nonetheless, Miss, this Pioneer Park used to be a wading pool. This is up on North uh, it's on Pine Street, north of Rice Street. They, go ahead, next one. They had a little wading pool there. Some, now it's a spray park. No lifeguards needed. No, I asked some parents, I, there's no supervision there whatsoever. I do go, next one please, you can just show a few of those of the spray park. I believe that if there had been a park board member in this area, um, or even some people, this is a working class neighborhood, when they decided to make this wading pool into a spray park, I don't know that those people in that area would have had the, the ability to go in and, and contest this. If they tried to make the McKinnon Park wading pool into a spray park, I know there would be an uprising. I know there would be. And then lastly, we have Meldrum Park. And Meldrum Park years ago, they decided to take this park, go ahead to the next one, and make a big water reservoir into the park. Now, if you'd like to live right across the street from this thing, I, I, say, I think there's probably some property for sale, but th that to me is not, if we're comparing this to a standard of a McKinnon Park, this, this is not acceptable. So I, I think there are different levels of beautification in our community. I think we need to bring many different voices to the table to talk about this. And, and I, I'm really actually not understanding 
the mayor still gets to pick the person in, this, in the districting. I, I don't know why there's, there is even a, a resistance against allowing to put those parameters in place. But I, I'm hoping that we, this thing passes, and I would hope if it does, the mayor would not veto it. Council Staley, would you mind making a motion, please? So I, I move to approve. Thank you. It's been a motion to approve this item. It has been seconded. Uh, roll call vote, please. Council Member Rolfing? No. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? No. Erpenbach? No. Kylie? No. Neitzert? Yes. Mayor votes no. It is failed 4-5. Item number nine. Second reading, an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the code of ordinances of the city by amending chapter 150, building rental housing. Mr. Mayor. Councilor Buck. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just briefly, for those folks that aren't, um, haven't been keeping up with this particular item, this is just a, a couple of housekeeping, housekeeping changes and um, then a, a couple of minor or changes to the existing rental registration ordinance. Um, the main issue that I've heard from landlords and the South Dakota Multi-Housing Association is the city really should be enforcing what we have now. And that's what this change will facilitate. We'll really want to help that happen in a more efficient manner. Currently, with many, and, and not all landlords, but those landlords who live outside Sioux Falls, there, tends, there can be an attitude of indifference to the condition of their property. And so this really um, did come from neighbors. It is one of those things that, that uh, will allow us um, a way to contact the person who, um, who can help facilitate changes if things need to be repaired. Um, it, d it helps it uh, protect tenants and it also helps protect landlords. And so, um, as I said last week, city staff members, including council staff, have worked with me over quite a long period of time, and I appreciate that. We, have, we started with big dreams and, and have, are really just taking one small step in the, in the right direction with this. The version of, ten, of the ordinance tonight, you'll see that I've asked um, Jim David to put the uh, proposed amendment up there. We, this is part of that conversation that we've been having going back and forth. Somebody said to me tonight, this is the sausage making part of government. And so um, as we talk about, um, as we've been talking with South Dakota multi-housing, we are putting in that idea of a contact person so that there really is that person somewhere within 50 miles that if, if I as an absent landlord, if I live in Arizona or wherever I might live, that there is someone here that will at least take a call from the city or will at least accept mail from the city if there are problems with that particular property and will be a facilitator in um, in making that the changes or, or the corrections or whatever needs to happen. You'll note though that this amendment um, changes the word um, responsible party to contact person and then persons, potential for more than one, um, in two places. But it does leave a place, there's one place, Jim, if you want to go down to subsection five there, whether the owner or responsible, no, come back up. Sorry, I'm not looking at it. I'm sorry, in, in the area that you were in, there's subsection five where it talks about, right, there's the second change, the owner's contact person there. But scroll up just a little bit, Jim, the... Keep going just a little bit farther. Subsection five there, whether the owner or responsible party, that's going to stay. The responsible party is going to stay there. That doesn't mean that the contact person is a responsible party, but there is someone that's going to be responsible. Very likely it is just that landlord. Um, and so that piece um, will stay in there. But we really are just looking for that contact person that will take that call or will accept that mail. And so um, that's, those are the changes to, again, it's an existing ordinance. It's already required in Sioux Falls to register your property if it is a rental property. And it is already <coughs> state law that if you are renting your home for 28 days or less, if it's a short-term rental, that you should be paying um, state sales tax for that. So that would be um, Matt Tobias is here from Code Enforcement. He can help answer questions if there are anything. But, um, that's the presentation, Mr. Mayor. Councilor Buck, thank you. Mm -hmm. Folks, again, this is a second reading. Uh, is there anybody who wanted to engage the council on this topic? Mm. C.R. Bruce, I suit bulbs. Um, if we're going to do this um, rental registry, I know some apartments that is not on the registry and has not been updated. 
I know that the city is flooded, that's why it says flooded with issues, but some of these properties have switched management four to five and six months and are not on the registry. So if we're gonna do this, we're gonna do it the right way and we're gonna get everybody on the registry. But the city is so swamped that there's holes. They can't, they can't even keep track of everybody on the record. So if you want me to tell the properties in public, I will, but I swear to God, I'm not lying. I am dealing with these properties as of right now. So before we make it a boom, boom city, make sure that we're up to par on the city ordinances because the city is drowning. Matt Tobias is drowning on calls for properties and he can't even keep up on the rental registry. And I know firsthand. So if we want to do these ordinances, make sure we're on top of it. Thank you so much. Folks, anybody else want to engage the council on this topic? Welcome. Tim Stanga. I don't know, I guess the thing is, I don't think people are aware of how many people are renting out their basements in this town, illegally. But when the neighbors turn them in, to Bryce, and I know Bryce, I talked to you last week, great conversation, I'm willing to work with you as much as I can to get things done. There's a lot of houses that are being illegally where they're renting out their basements. And when the, when the, the neighbors turn them in, the city goes over and they can't prove that it's being rented out, but yet it is being rented out. So. One, we got to address that issue. Two, I guess uh, there's a lot of homeowners out there that don't take care of their houses to begin with. These are homeowners, not renters. They're not uh, landlords or nothing. Are we going to make them guys register their bank that they have a loan so we have a contact person through the bank? So if we can't get the homeowner to clean it up or fix up their property, we can call up the bank the, re, the, the one that's really on that property and make them clean it up and make them do the, the fix-ups on that property? It's too bad that we can't sit down as a community and work things out. I agree. There, yeah, there are some landlords that are bad landlords, but I know a lot of good ones. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we put them all into one egg, but we have homeowners that should not be homeowners but they are. What I'd like to see is the city come out with a program that whenever somebody buys a home, we take them aside and we tell them what, they recommend, what, what we look at as a homeowner, what you have to do as a homeowner, and to be able to let them realize that if you're not gonna fit the homeowner status, that we will we'll come down on you. I also understand that Bryce, when he goes out on some calls and uh, he gets them to clean them up, Instead of having him come out a month later to make sure that it's cleaned up, and I've talked to Bryce about it, he can't do that. What is it? Matt. Is it Matt? I thought it was Bryce. Excuse me. He knows what I'm talking about. But uh, I guess the thing is, is he knows what I'm talking about because he knows that he should go check on that property a month or two months later to make sure that that property is being cleaned up. So... Let's try to work together. Let's try to be able to look at all avenues. Let's try to look at the people that are renting basements. And let's try to work things out. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Sorry. Folks, anybody else want to engage the council on this topic? Welcome. Good evening, and thank you. I am Denise Hanslick. I am representing South Dakota Multi-Housing. We do stand in support of the ordinance, ordinance as amended and we will work with the city staff to um, achieve a greater number of registered rental properties. Thank you. Denise, thank you. Anybody else? Welcome. Bruce Daniels from Sioux Falls. I just wanted to, uh, uh, mention something that's been brought to my attention by uh, several small uh, renters, people who are actually on the rental registry, that uh, 
that's kind of uh, bothering quite a few people. And this is just a, what I've asked Jim to put up here is just a small cross section of a bunch of uh, letters that seem to go out. As soon as somebody gets on the rental registry, all of a sudden these individuals get bombarded with uh, requests to, to, uh, from people that want to buy the property or take, the, take it away. And some of these individuals have said that as soon as they're on the rental registry and, uh, and they're trying to do what they're supposed to be doing, all of a sudden they start getting harassed by code enforcement or by certain types of neighbors. And, and uh, so they, they've asked me to just come and, and lay this out and just talk about it a little bit, that there seems to be some kind of a problem with this rental registry that these people put their names down as they're required to do, as they're requested to do. And then as it turns out, they go home, they get bombarded with this stuff, they get bombarded with code enforcement issues and to the point where they want to sell their property and get out of it, or they have to hire some property management firm to do the job. And there's, there's a serious problem with this coming out of there. And then as we've heard in other testimonies over the last few months, these people have put their names on the line and then code enforcement in the city of Sioux Falls doesn't even look at that rental registry to see what's going on with that property. There should be just one master list of property in this town to say, that you, Mr. Mayor, own a piece, this piece of property and Joe Smith over here owns this piece of property. It, it would seem like there would be one spot to do that. And if the city's going to keep a list, then that's the main list you go to. Not this time you go to the tax board or this one you go over here to this, to this assessor or this one you go to this property management company. There should be, it, you're trying to have one registry. Why don't we clean this thing up and make it one registry? Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Anybody else, folks? Welcome. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor. Good evening. I'm smiling now because we're on my we're back on real in my turf right now. So, uh, owning rental properties could here, you, sir. In could Sioux you Falls. introduce yourself to the people of Sioux Falls? George Hamilton. Thanks, George. The Mayor of Maine. <laughs> I think you gave me that name. Uh, this is a good idea. It was a better idea the first time it was proposed and it's been cleaned up some, but the issue here is I'm in full support of this. It just doesn't have enough teeth in it because as we deal with rental properties, we're talking about in this ordinance simply absentee landlords and not being able to get in touch with people who are responsible for the property. And that is something that can easily be addressed, and that is something that teeth can be put into. Because owning properties and dealing with code enforcement and dealing with issues, when they know who owns the property and how to get in contact with the owner of the property, they can get your attention. But when you have to search for somebody and find out that this property is owned by Joe Blow and Joe Blow lives in Timbuktu and Joe Blow doesn't have anybody here who's responsible for the property, then the property gets cited, then summons the issues, then the property gets tore down. And it seems like people are complaining that the city is stepping on private property and homeowners rights when all they're looking for is accountability from people who own the property. So any way that you can put a measure before and get some teeth into it where you can contact somebody. Now, the issue that uh, Bruce brought up about people contacting us about selling the properties and all of that there, I've got these flyers and everything and stuff. It just goes in the junk mail with the rest of the stuff. I'm not interested in selling my properties. I am interested in maintaining my properties. I'm interested in my neighbors maintaining their properties. I'm interested in our neighborhoods being maintained in any way that you can get in touch with a person or a corporation or entity of any sort to have somebody come out and address a piece of property when it's not being taken care of. This should address that. Thank you. Thank you, George. Appreciate it. Folks, anybody else? Council? Mr. Mayor? Yes. I would move to approve. Second. It's been a motion to approve uh, this item and it has been seconded. Councilor Urbanbach. Mr. Mayor, I would um, make a motion to amend 
um, 150.177 subsection B, subsection 2, by replacing the words the responsible party with a contact person. And I would add that um, parentheses contact persons, that isn't what's written in there. And replacing responsible party in 150.180 with, again, contact persons with parentheses around the S at the end. Second. Second. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Buck has been a motion to amend this item. It has been seconded by Councilor Vice Chair Erickson. Councilor Buck, did you want to explain this? Just, just uh, briefly, Mr. Mayor, um, Mr. Mayor George is correct that this started in a, much, in a much tougher place. It started in a place where we could have stronger conversations with property owners. And I appreciate your support, George. It's, it's, it's well-meaning. And this actually came from your neighborhood, and you know that. This is one of those things that we need to talk about in terms of how do we protect those landlords? How do we protect those tenants? But number one, how do we protect those neighbors? And so this is one of those ways that we're just trying to make a step toward a better system of dealing with rental property in this city. It is a very small step, but it is a step. And in order to get this to pass and to keep this conversation going, we're making that change to contact persons so that there is someone that will just answer the phone or take the mail. The one other thing I would say in response to um, some misinformation that's been stated is that your ownership of property, if your home, whether you rent it or not, your ownership of property, your address, is all public record and it's all available at the courthouse. It also says whether you are owner occupied and if it says doesn't say owner occupied that means you're probably renting it out. That's all available at the courthouse. The city is not selling that list. That is not where those folks are getting that those mailings. And my mom gets the same mailings so she doesn't have rental property. So that one you'll have to just that just goes with the territory of owning property. So thank you Councilor, for thank you. Councilor Erickson. Can I ask one question either Please. of Councilor Urbanbach or uh, Matt Tobias and um, Tobias, excuse me. Um, you just said something that kind of clicked with me, where it said you said it's owner uh, owner occupied or unowner occupied. Is that a list that we can get and you can get and cross reference that and start sending out the information to make sure that we get these contact information? Because I know I own property and it's unowner occupied and I'm listed with with you guys. But there's got to be an easier way instead of knocking on doors and saying, "Hey, I need your contact information because you own rentals." True. Good evening, Mayor, Council, Matt Tobias, uh, Code Enforcement Manager, Planning and Building Services. Uh, we do access the, we have access to the county records that we do check owner-occupied status. And we, we, can, we can use that and then that, that triggers us to then do some investigating and figure out if it's a rental or not. So we do have, we do have access to the county green screens as we call them. And that, that, that information is there for us. So you, you'll generate some of your lists from then to work off of and try to yep. get your information updated because yep. I'm yes. guessing it's somewhat outdated just over time and mm -hmm. you've been working to clean up some of that. So, yep. okay, thank you. Well, and, and if I might, Mr. Mayor, it, it includes only the property address. It doesn't include the owner. If a landlord lives somewhere else, it doesn't include mm -hmm. that. Right, it's just the so that's, yep. that's, that's this issue of, of the city having a separate list is mm -hmm. that that list isn't complete for what the city needs in order to again protect these rights. In our rental registration list, it is a, it's a very diverse, I mean, it's a, it's a big list. And we do use it, all departments, and we all departments will be using it. And we have one department that's not using it now, but we're all gonna be on the same page. We're using that, that's how we generate our letters and our contacts on how those go out. So I've explained it to Councilor Neitzer earlier in the day. Um, it's when we have an issue with the property or anything comes up, if there's all the different contacts listed for that property, it's, it automatically generates letters that go out. So. That rental registration list is, it's a very important list. I mean, I've, you've heard me say that before, so. A roll call vote on the amendment, please. Council Member Rolfing. Yes. Selberg. Yes. Starr. Yes. Staley. Yes. Erickson. Yes. Erpenbach. Yes. Kiley. Yes. Neitzert. Yes. Council, we now have an amended motion. Is there any discussion on the amended motion? Councilor Starr. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would move to amend um, subsection 2B after phone number and comma and insert the word email comma and i would second that motion councilor star thank you uh, councilor Mbach, thank you there has been a uh, an amendment made to the amended motion and did you get that no sir uh, uh, councilor star would you mind repeating that please absolutely it's the same subsection uh 
uh, B2, where we just amended the word, uh, we added contact person. So it's prior to that where it lists the name, phone number, comma, email, comma, is where I'm inserting it. Very good. Councilors, do you all understand the, uh, the amendment has been proposed? Actually, Mr. Mayor, if I can Yes, Councilor Starr, uh, my apologies. Matt, no, that's okay. Matt, would you come back? I just I want to make sure that this is okay. Um, one of the very good things that happens during the meeting, people feel they can text during the meeting, and uh, this was a good suggestion that I got from a member of the audience that mm -hmm. maybe adding email gives us a delivery receipt and maybe a, a more modern way of, of reaching some people that won't bother your database or cause any undue uh, concern. So no, I, I want to make sure that... I think it's fine. I think it'd be a great idea. Perfect. Thank you. A roll call vote, please, on I, the amendment. Mr. On, Mayor, if I might just add to that the comments, so because people change email addresses frequently, I would just remind folks that that last section of this ordinance requires, if there's going to be a change in this information, it has to be changed within 30 days. So that's that. I mean, part of the onus is on the person who mm -hmm. wants to be contacted. Mm -hmm. But Councilor Starr's amendment is right. Yep. A roll call vote, please, on the amendment. Council Member Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erbenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. That, is, that amendment has also passed 8-0. Thank you. Council, if there's no other discussion, a roll call vote, please. Council Members Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erbenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0. Thank you, Council. Item 10. Second reading as amended at the City Council meeting on August 1, 2017. An ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property located at northeast corner of East 6th Street and North Bonson Avenue from the AG Agriculture District to the LW Live Work District, petition number 6219-2017, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Councilor Staley? Yes, I will be recusing myself, and uh, if anyone has questions about that, call me. Thank you. <laughs> Michael? Mayor Council, I'm Mike Cooper with City Planning and Building Services. Tonight we have a, a second reading regarding a zoning amendment request. The applicants are Lois and Kelly Brown. They're the owners of the six-acre parcel at the northeast corner of 6th and Bonson Avenue. Uh, they are proposing to rezone this from agriculture to the live work zoning designation, which as we've discussed before, provides a variety of potential land uses. Um, at the last council meeting, August 1st, we heard from the applicant as well as from the Oakview neighborhood. The city council did um, vote on two amendments that would add two conditions for consideration tonight to the live work zoning designation. The first condition would restrict what we call the MD2 form, and what that means in English is that any multifamily buildings that would be constructed on this site would have to be no more than two stories high and no more than 24 units per building. The second condition that is being considered tonight would be to provide for a traffic impact analysis, which includes a review of a pedestrian and traffic plan as well as providing for the potential additional right-of-way uh, for the possible future realignment of 6th and Bonson. So those two conditions are on the table tonight as part of your consideration for second reading. Very good, Michael. Thank you. Folks, I know there's a number of uh, people that are very interested in this topic here tonight. Uh, I'm not going to tell you exactly what to do. That's not my intent. However, I'm going to make a recommendation. Um, there have been a bevy of comments, very, very good, very, very productive, very, very professional, very, very cordial, all those that have been made over months of time uh, on one of the most debated, discussed topics I've been involved in since I've been your mayor. That's good. What I'm just going to recommend is that you don't have to repeat those comments tonight. You don't. Uh, this council is engaged. They understand this topic. They have been engaging you at a very, very high level. Now, if you want to come forward and repeat some of those, I'm not going to shut you down. Uh, I'm just telling you it's not necessary. Now, if you want to talk about some of the things that have been recently discussed uh, last week, 
Um, come on forward. I think the council would certainly in, uh, enjoy hearing from you. Um, but again, let's start. Uh, anybody want to engage the council on this very important topic? Welcome. Thanks, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Tony Burke, President of the Oakview Neighborhood Association, and my family live at 804 North Caleb Avenue, and I completely agree with you, Mayor, about redundancies and comments, so thank you for that. Th thank you. Um, your gracious patience to the details presented over the last year has spoken volumes to the importance about the proposed rezoning of Lacey Homestead. This rezoning, though, we believe as an association is no longer about the neighbors, no longer about the proposed rezoning, and no longer um, even about the property owners. This is a case study about a prospective precedent setting change in practice that, many, that may affect decisions and volume of work for future property owners, developers, neighbors, planning de department, and planning commission when it comes to a rezoning application on an infill property in Sioux Falls. By passing this rezoning request from Ag to Live Work with amendments without a site plan as like as one Sioux Falls resident so aptly stated, moving forward on a construction project without a set of blueprints. Do we truly understand the implications of how improving the proposed rezoning without a site plan is going to affect the planning and development process? Could it detrimentally affect the property owner if a property owner rezones without a site plan? An offer comes along for the property owner it didn't think of and must now go back to another rezone or a conditional use permit? Could it affect the interest of developers? May it affect the character of a neighborhood in a positive or negative way? We are looking at a crystal ball trying to see the future, which is very cloudy and shapes unknown risk. Again, thank you for your actively listening and engaging. This is a tough leadership decision, and we entrust you will make the right one to our for our communities for many years to come. Thank you. Tony, thank you as well. Welcome. Good evening. I'm Pat Smith. I live at 432 North Linwood. I got a stopwatch running. I'll be your quickest person up here. Um, my house is a third one in, 432 North Linwood. I've lived there for 24 years, built the house. Our Lois talked about things changing. We could watch our daughter run to the first grade from the kitchen window because there was no houses in between. But we can't get out sometimes the way it is now. My wife changed her work hours. She's worked at the Sharapa building since it opened, 12 years or whatever. And she changed her work hours from seven to four because closer to eight, you can't get out. I'll be out mowing the yard after school starts, and bang, bang. It's loud enough you could hear it over the lawnmower. There's no left turn lane. People going into those apartments and townhouses, they're getting rear-ended, and then it's two or three cars. The police will be over there. When I go to work, I have to go east and over to Sycamore and across Arrowhead and back. And if you do a traffic study, I implore you to do it after school starts. Otherwise, it's meaningless. It is darkly meaningless, because it changes a lot. And uh, thanks a lot. We'll see you. No, great job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, folks, anybody else want to engage the council on this topic before I turn it over to them? Welcome. John Stratman here in Sioux Falls. John, welcome. Um, to uh, suggest that a site plan be rendered by the Browns would require that there be something proposed for them to build or, or a developer to build. I think that's pretty unreasonable. Um, these folks just want to sell the property to the highest possible value. Uh, that's all they've asked for. They've paid their taxes. I don't know the Browns. I don't know any people live in the neighborhood. I just think it's wrong the way that uh, they've been hassled and treated uh, in the whole matter. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Welcome. Mr. Mayor, Council Member, my name is David Eastman. I live um, actually in the middle of town on Phillips Avenue. I'm here because I also own the uh, properties on solar. <clears throat> I own uh, all of the twin homes across the street and also on third. And actually, my wife and I. And uh, I think our properties will probably be affected more than anybody else. We've owned these properties uh, since uh, either new or almost new, over 20 years. The, um, further back than that, our family, or my wife's family, been in Sioux Falls since 1875. The, uh, my grand, great grandparents- David, my, my apologies, sir. Are you sure you're talking about this particular item, or is it an item later on in the, in the discussion? 
I don't understand, Mayor. Why would you say that? Um, the, I'm sorry. The reason why I, I, that's coming up in the future, in, in, in just a little bit, what I'm going to bring up, that's a sample. I, 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 the reason why I bring this tonight is everybody is talking about um, what a plan is for a neighborhood. I saw that as I w in our neighborhood, and it was a prime example of what somebody is doing to help neighbors understand what is going to be changing in the neighborhood. Okay. That's the only reason. No, very good. Good people. job. Okay. Continue, sir. My apologies. We have, uh, um, like I said, my great-grandparents farmed 49th and Bonson, 900 acres there for many, many years. My uncle actually used to, great uncle, used to work for the Lacey's north, on a farm north of 6th Street many years ago. The reason I bring that up is we understand, my family, and me as an owner in that neighborhood, my wife and I, that farmland becomes neighborhoods. The point that, that really concerns us and that we're actually afraid of is this new neighborhood, and we're not um, against the Browns uh, redoing the neighborhood that they have. We, we, we know that's going to happen, but we're afraid uh, that it's going to turn into another Redwood Estates. Somebody brought up earlier how, how that has changed. I have lived with that for 20 years. And if, if, if this is not planned, if people do not know what's going to, what's going to happen, um, I've, been, I've been in real estate 42 years. I've sold hundreds of new homes. I have never seen a house that was built without, without a blueprint. Mm. Thank you very much. And sir, my apologies. Good, no, good job. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Welcome. Council members, Arlie Brindy, Brindy and Metters, Sioux Falls. I represent uh, Kelly and Lois Brown. They're here tonight uh, not to say anything, because you've heard it all. I just want to make an opening and closing our statement. Thank you. No time. The Browns concur with the council amendment from last week. No MD2 zoning. Uh, housing. Cooperating uh, on a right of way at 6th and uh, Bonson with the city, if the city wants to do that, and now we're told that's not in the immediate plan. And number three, uh, a traffic pedestrian plan. With the engineering office, Heath Hofteaser is on record on this property as saying he's confident the city can work with the developer to ensure safety. So let's just take the the worst case scenario that we're talking about from the neighborhood or the few people in the neighborhood who claim to be representing thousands of people in that neighborhood. There's 12 different uses. So let's just say it, it was apartments. Uh, that's the great concern. Heath Hoff teaser went on record when uh, the Lloyd proposal was here last year two years ago, saying, I can work with the developer to ensure safety. The property was put up for sale April of 2014. It's been three years and four months, about 40 months, one offer. Uh, we're not going to get any more. People tell us there's no more until you have some zoning. There's 12 uses here. I'm imploring you to give the Browns the right to market this to someone who can have a plan that would be passed if it met the city requirements that I'm saying we'll live with. Thank you very much. Mr. Brandy, thank you as well. Uh, Council, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, Councilor Neitzert. We've talked about this endlessly, so I'm not gonna go over all the issues again. I'm only gonna focus on the concerns that have been expressed to me in the last week. As far as density, we can all debate what the right amount is. In the end, I'm not in favor of imposing an arbitrary number of units when we have no idea what the right number is. We'd just be picking a number. There's no logic or rationale behind a number. I'd simply pick one out of the air. After discussions with the school district, 
traffic engineers and the police, as well as analyzing accident histories and traffic data, I'm confident that this intersection and these roads have well more than enough capacity to handle a multifamily or other similar development. I have no doubt that the roads are challenging during the school year during the peak times. That's true at just about any school in the city to some extent, and I understand with two schools at the same time, you've got quite a challenge. In the end, the hard data and the experts tell me that these roads and this intersection can more than handle this development. Remember that city staff recommended approval of the original plan that was potentially even more dense than this, and the traffic engineers had no concerns at that time. In terms of safety, particularly of pedestrians and children, that is and was my number one concern. I wouldn't support this if I didn't feel that it could be done safely. I'm confident that our traffic engineers and our standards will ensure that this development will not be unduly hazardous to the public. Children traverse driveways on a daily basis, and thankfully, car pedestrian incidents are extremely rare. Finally, I'd like to address the lack of a site plan. It's a fair question and concern. I've thought a lot about it. There is no requirement that a site plan must be provided. It's nice, it helps, but it's not required. A site plan is helpful particularly when you need to see that a potential negative effect is mitigated with site design. Without a site plan, I have to ask myself, do I believe that the built-in regulations in shaped places, the required buffer yards, the setbacks, parking, screening standards, are sufficient to ensure that a project will be safe and not create undue negative impacts on adjacent properties? The answer for me is yes. One of the major goals of shaped places compared to the previous 1983 ordinance was to build in required standards that every project has to provide. One of the downsides of the old ordinance was conditions and buffers required on a project were unpredictable and inconsistent. They were many times at the whims of the planning commission at a conditional use permit hearing. The regulations, the buffers, the transition requirements citizens asked for over and over for all those years are now built in. In addition, every project has to go through an agency review, has to meet the engineering design standards, has to meet the drainage, the traffic. It has to go through the building codes. A rezoning without a site plan is far from a blank check. I would also point out that we had two site plans under the original proposal and that still didn't alleviate the concerns for the neighbors. In the end, a property owner should be allowed to use her property for its highest and best use, balanced against the public good. And I believe this, this accomplishes that. So I encourage your support and approval. Councilman, I say, would you want to make a motion? And then I'm going to go to the rest of the council. I'll make a motion to approve. Second, Urban Bank. A motion to approve this item. It has been seconded. Any other discussion, Council? Councilor Starr. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I would move to remand item 10 to the Planning Commission. That has failed for lack of a second. Any other discussion? Just a, if I could. Councilor Starr. Absolutely. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I guess what concerns me more than anything, and we've, we've talked about whether there's a development plan or not, but a lot of times in my short time on the council, we've talked about different developers being here, and we've trusted them to do what they've said. Yes, a development plan is not required as part of a, a zoning change as part of this. But we've, hold, we've held a lot of uh, developers very accountable. We've said you're with XYZ developer, and we know you're a person of your word. You've got a long-term reputation in Sioux Falls, and we trust that you'll do the right thing. Um, live work on this piece of property is something that staff um, and Director Cooper came up with as part of a compromise to try to make this a, a workable plan. Again, balancing the public good with the optimal property rights or the owners of the property. Um, by moving forward with live work, we're not, um, we're at the whim of the, the developer or the person who ends up buying this property. Infill uh, property, or you know, in this type of situation, these are probably the most difficult ones we do. This kind of development, changing it to live work um, on the outskirts of town or in an undeveloped part of town would make sense. This for me doesn't make sense for the area until we had some kind of plan and getting a chance to do that. I would probably disagree with some of the things that we do as, as part of uh, our, our new zoning requirements and there are, are safeguards, some safeguards put in place, but this is our one bite at the apple tonight. And there isn't a deal, there isn't anything moving forward other than we're getting a chance to maybe uh, market a piece of property. 
I've spent the time with the Browns. I think they're great people, but this is still a, a business, what's in the best interest of the community as well as their property rights at the same time. I'm not able to support live work tonight without some way of moving forward and seeing some kind of plan to protect the neighborhood and provide the best opportunity for the neighbors. When we've talked about this offline and toured and done things, we've said what's the best use for this piece of property and I think we feel very strongly, or many of us feel very strongly, this is an apartment complex area. It's going to be some type of uh, uh, a property in that. That doesn't uh, do what we need to do with live work. Live work has a work component in the name of it. This ultimately isn't gonna end up as a live work but a residential zoning. And that's why I felt that it was probably important to at least take a shot at uh, referring it back to the Planning Commission to uh, come up with the right uh, plan for the, for the area and a developer who respects the, uh, the neighborhood and balances the rights of maximizing their profit. Thank you. A roll call vote, please. Council members Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? No. St Erickson? Yes. Erbenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. That is passed, six to one. Thank you, Council. Item 11. First reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the Code of Ordinances of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, by revising boundaries for voting precinct as set forth in sections 38.003 of Chapter 38, Elections. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to come from here so I could move this, uh, move this around. Anyway, this, pre this ordinance revises our precinct ordinances, and as you know, within the ordinance, we write out the physical boundaries of each one of those precincts, and they're generally translated onto a map. Uh, so I'm going to talk through some of the changes. Actually, I'm going to talk through all the changes that are in here uh, in this brief presentation for the first, br uh, for the first reading. As you know, the... <coughs> Mr. Stenga, I'd ask for your cooperation, please, in maintaining professionalism within our... Um, our meeting here tonight. Thank you. Tom, my apologies that that had to happen. Mr. Greco, please proceed. Yes, and so as you know, the Districting Commission presented their final report on at the third meeting of, in July. Uh, it's effective tonight unless this approved by the City Council. Uh, in that, it reflected six precinct changes, and the changes are in and amongst certain districts, uh, but the bottom line with this ordinance is that the ordinance reflects those changes by renumbering certain precincts, and each one of those are circled in red on this particular um, portion of the map. Uh, we've renumbered them so that so as to avoid any confusion with recent numbers that were used over the past 10 years. Uh, this should be a fairly straightforward process. Now, the other changes that are made are down are in the Northeast District on the far east side of Precinct 411, right over here, the areas in black. Those were areas that have been annexed over the past few years. They don't have residents in them. They haven't had residents in them for previous elections. Uh, so we put off basically until this year in coordination with the county uh, to rewrite the ordinance so that, include, that it includes those annexed areas. Uh, basically, if you're wondering, the way it was written, it was not an expandable area um, in terms of just being, being able to fill out the map to include annexed areas. Uh, this does it. It makes, the, it, makes it a more workable, um, uh, more workable precinct boundary. The other item that I think is of importance for you to understand, and I'll do my best as, at explaining it, is currently precinct 4-6 is this square with the southern boundary being this dotted line over here. 4-7, although the number's here now because that's proposed, but 4-7 is this box right here, and 4-11 was bounded on the north originally right here along with 4-6. This boundary between uh, the present day 4-6 and 4-11 and 4-7 for that matter, this boundary that currently exists is an imaginary line. It's not a geographic feature. Uh, that's just a vestige of the way the ordinance was written in the past. Our goal with this is to create, obviously, a physical feature to make it more understandable for residents. Because as you'll see, there are a few streets over here where I have the, uh, the, hand, the cursor uh, where the uh, boundary intersects the street perpendicular so your neighbor could be in a different district than you. Bottom line, we want to make it a more definable boundary so that people understand uh, where they're voting, particularly when they're talking to their neighbors and to help avoid confusion. So the new boundary would be the area bounded for Precinct 47 
uh, bounded by this purple line. It uh, appears to expand precinct 47 significantly, particularly with respect to population. It does not have a huge increase with respect to population, and certainly with um, registered voters, it increases the number of registered voters in precinct 47 by about 500. Uh, for all of these changes that I'm rec that we're proposing in this particular ordinance, uh, we do intend, in anticipation of the next election, of sending out precinct uh, or election postcard reminders, uh, clearly identifying the changes that were made in anticipation of the next election. So I would urge a second reading, and I would uh, urge your support for the second reading and approval of the ordinance. Tom, very good Thank presentation. You. Again, my apologies for interrupting it. Uh, Council, um, it's now in your hands, folks. I would. I would move approval. I would second. Thank you, Councilor Rolfing and Councilor Rubenbach. We'd both like to set a date of hearing and second reading for Tuesday, August 5th, 15th, for this particular item. Councilor Rolfing. Just, just very quickly, I, I need to thank Mr. Greco and the committee that was put together to do this. They worked hard and diligently on this and came up with some very good solutions. So I just publicly want to thank them very much. Thank you, and I'll pass that on to them. And Mr. Mayor, if I can, just real quick, uh, thank also. Yes. We want to point out Jeff Schmidt from the Planning and Zoning, um, our Chief Planning and Zoning official, but more importantly, Maggie Elliott, for, Maggie Elliott from GIS, who has put several iterations of all these maps together. She does a great job, and we appreciate it. Tom, I appreciate that. I, I, I bet the council wouldn't mind also. if you Do you have the names of the committee members? I will, and I intended on preparing something perhaps for the... Um, the Would you mind just reading them off real quick oh, while I can't... Uh, while Jim Councilor Fry, Jason Waringa, uh, Jeffrey Eckhoff, Mark Millage, and Deborah Ellison uh, all served on the, on the commission. Very good. Thank you so much, Tom. Councilor Rolfing, thank you as well. Any other discuss? Yes, Councilor Starr. Um, Mr. Greco, um, we've set, we're setting the boundaries for the precincts as part of this. Are we also setting the voting locations then for the next municipal election as part of this, or is that a separate process that no, we go uh, through? No, Councillor, that's a separate process um, that we'll visit later as we get closer to the election. Uh, but I will tell you right now that the precincts for each one of the um, each one of the precincts that were redistricted, redesignated, and also these changes here, the <coughs> polling locations have not changed. Um, so there, there will be no polling location changes for those, but the polling locations will come later on this year. Early next Thank year. you. Good job. A roll call vote, please. Council members Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kiley? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. That is passed. Eight to zero. Item 12, please. First reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the Code of Ordinances for Chapter 156, Floodplain Management. Mayor Council, Albert Schmidt, City of Sioux Falls Planning Office, here to present the floodplain ordinance change for you. This is the first reading. This ordinance update is directly reflective of the Southwest floodplain change to meet FEMA regulations to update the map dates in the ordinance. Albert, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, Council, any comments? I would move, uh, set the hearing date for Tuesday, August 15th. Second, Selberg. Thank you, councilors. I appreciate that. A roll call vote, please. Council members Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kiley? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. That is passed. Eight to zero. Council item 13. A resolution approving the special assessment rule for repair or demolition of real property in various areas in the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Good evening, Mayor Council. Uh, Matt Tobias, Code Enforcement Manager. Um, tonight before you on this uh, particular item, item 13, it's addressing um, building demolitions. And this is our assessment role. So basically what we're doing here is we're gonna address um, bills that we've, work the city has done that has not been paid. So like we said, um, there's two demolitions on our rolls here. We have one in Minnehaha County, one in Lincoln County. Uh, the first one in Minnehaha County here, it was a, we boarded up a house on um, 605 South Duluth Avenue. And the same thing in Lincoln County there, 5412 South Holbrook, we actually had to board up a house. Thank you, Matt, I appreciate it. Did anybody want to speak to this item? Councilors? Move to approve, Erkenbach. Thank you. Councilor Box has made a motion to approve this resolution, seconded by Councilor Chair Kiley. A roll call vote, please. Council members Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erkenbach? Yes. Kiley? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0, item 14. 
A resolution approving the special assessment role for litter removal in various areas in the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Good evening again. I'm Matt Tobias, Code Enforcement Manager. Um, this assessment role is for litter removals. Um, this past year we had, in this past assessment period, we had nine different litter removals um, with a total of $2,998.63. Um, you'll see them on the rolls here. Um, that's just what they are. Uh, we, had to actually, we actually had to use uh, city staff to go in and, and uh, pick some of that litter up and do those cleanups. Uh, we have a couple there, a couple of the larger ones there. One was a case that actually made the news on 111 South Lindale. Uh, it was just a bad situation where we had to clean a lot of that property up. And then 530 North Cliff has been a property we've had to clean up it, twice. Um, same thing, it's, uh, we, had a, we had a judgment from the courts. The courts gave us a judgment. So we go back and just have to clean that property. Unfortunately, we have to go back and clean that property up. So we had nine total this year for litter removals, and that's what we have. Thank you, Matt. Did anybody want to speak to this particular resolution? Councilors? Move for Rolfing. Second, Second Selberg. Selberg. Thank you, Councilor mm -hmm. Rolfing. Thank you, Councilor Selberg. Uh, Councilor Urbach. Just one point of clarification, Matt. Um, would you talk about the the links that you go to to oh, yeah. see if people will pay these i mean we're this is kind of last resort if i if my memory serves if you could talk about how do you talk with people about paying it that kind of thing yeah so this is that, that's a good point thanks for bringing that up counselor um we have vetted our process at this point in time uh, we've made several contacts with the with the landowners uh, property owners on this case it starts off in the, with a complaint that comes into our office and we send someone out to do an investigation after that, then we'll send a letter out, and then we'll, we'll send a, a multiple of letters, and then it'll get to the citation level. We'll do first citation is 100, second citation is 200, third citation is 300, and then it gets referred to the city attorney's office. And then at that point in time, we still continue the process of trying to work with the person. Um, and then we just get to the point where we've exhausted all of our options, and then we unfortunately have to have city staff have city landfill staff go in there, work really closely with the health department on coordination on getting the city staff to do that to actually perform that cleanup. One other question, if I might, um, just because it kind of relates to the conversation we had earlier, are, are these aren't necessarily rental properties. These are homeowners yeah. or um, property business owners, whatever. It, yes. These are all kinds of property owners across the board. You've gone after trying to get them to bring their property up to code. Yeah. And you've heard me say this before, but it's not something that we, code enforcement doesn't, we don't like to do this. Uh, this is the part that we don't, this is, we always say that we have a 90% success rate. This is our 10%. This is our 10% right here. So it's, a, it's an extremely time consuming process, but it's, it's, it's something we have to do. Thanks, Matt. A Rokoville, please. Council members Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0. Thank you. Item 15. A resolution approving the special assessment role for snow removal in various areas in the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Matt? Okay. Matt Tobias, Code Enforcement Manager. Um, once again, we have snow removal on the list, on the list right here the, for a total of $1,554.86. Um, only 20 on this list. And I'll say only 20 on that list. Um, that's just what we had to go through and to hire a contractor, go out and do, those, do, those, uh, do the work out there. But we had 20 bills that were unpaid this year. So that's where we're at. Thanks, Matt. Did anybody want to speak to this item? Council? Move approval, Rolfing. Second, Neitzert. Thank you, Councilor Rolfing. Councilor Neitzert, a roll call vote, please. Council members Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. That has passed 8 to 0, item 16. <clears throat> a resolution approving the special assessment role for tree trimming in various areas in the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, Kelby Maris with Parks and Recreation. This resolution is a result of uh, forestry code enforcement programs uh, that address low hanging branches over streets and sidewalks and also the removal of dead and diseased private trees. Kelby, thank you. Did anybody want to speak to this item? Council? Move approval, Rolfing. Second, Starr. Thank you, Councilor Rolfing. Thank you, Councilor Starr. Councilor Staley. Um, this is Project Trim. I, I, right, 
We're talking about project trim here. Some of these items, yes, are from project trim. Okay, and, and just for the record, I, I think that project trim should be gone. I, I cannot support any, any fines levied on citizens for this, so I'll be voting no. Councilor Nicer. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that, that I've had concerns about project trim and in the last year I wanted to educate myself and uh, so I went on a project trim ride along. I spent about half a day and I was actually